Hey, we're uh, finishing up this series called Unboxed, and tonight I just kind of want to wrap that up. It'd be terrible to have a, a Christmas gift that somebody gave you, and you never unboxed it, you never unwrapped it. Wouldn't that be horrible? And then somebody comes by to see you, and there's that gift still yet there. And I know sometimes we get, like, weird gifts. Anybody ever get a weird gift for Christmas? Like one year, I think I got a used lottery ticket somebody gave me. Maybe it wasn't used, but it, it didn't make me any money, so I guess that's the same. Um, someone I was talking today about unusual weird gifts, and Al, our trainer, we asked, we went to the gym on Christmas Eve. He said, you know, we're always talking about healthy. Somebody gave me a box of chocolates for Christmas. And he said, I opened it up, and sure enough, there's a whole box of chocolates but he said what it was, somebody had taken the time to take little rocks, dip them in chocolate, and put them in the box, and put sticks over the top of that. That's a pretty weird gift, right? I, I saw uh, somebody said, uh, embroidered toilet paper. Uh, that seems a little weird to me. Uh, and I, I, what did I, a motion sensory toilet bowl light. Uh, there's a lot of things just came to my mind, but I won't say them. Here's one, a bacon air freshener. Look, I have enough time. I have enough time uh, resisting a food, let alone have an air freshener of bacon. The greatest gift of all, though, is the gift of Jesus Christ coming, right? Yeah, so let's, let's thank God for that. In your notes there is a, is, a, is a verse that talks about from Luke chapter 2, verse 10. The angel of the Lord said to them, would you say it, read it out loud with me? Do not be afraid, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. Joy. So uh, the, my favorite definition of joy, I think we have it there for you. If not, it's on the screen. It's from K. Warren. It's joy is a settled assurance that God is in control, say in control. in control. He's in control of all the details of my life, the quiet confidence, I love this next line, say it with me, that ultimately everything is going to be all right and the determined choice to praise God in all things. Now our kids next door learned another definition of joy, it's a little shorter and here it is. Joy is finding a way to be happy even when things don't go your way. So we've been talking about the different Grinches that try to steal our joy. So we talked about busyness, stress, anxiety, and disappointment. And if you weren't here for any of those, I would encourage you to go online and, and look at those. I think they're worthwhile to look at. But tonight I want to wrap this all up uh, by looking at this one. Here's the next one. This is a fill-in in your notes, if you're taking notes, that we want to watch out for the Grinch of confusion, the Grinch of confusion. Because when we're confused, confusion drains our joy. Like you make a decision for life, and then you second guess yourself on that decision. Well, maybe that wasn't the right decision, and then you back away from that. And so that, that back and forth, and never believing in yourself, never understanding, that causes confusion. And when you have the confusion, we have a loss of joy. And then a lot of people say something like this, well, I don't really know what I'm supposed to do with my life, and that brings confusion. If you don't know, I mean, God gave you a purpose, but if you don't know what that is, then you're always looking here, you're looking there, you're trying to copy somebody else, and that brings confusion, a lack of joy. Or maybe you're in a situation right now, and you say, I'm just confused, I don't know what to do. I'd, I'd like to be married, but it doesn't look like it's going to work. Or maybe you're married and you say, you know, I'm, I'm really working on my marriage, but I don't know if it's, I'm just, I just feel confused. In the Bible story, everybody but the angels were confused. The wise men were confused. The shepherds were confused. Watch this. Mary was confused. Joseph was confused. Herod was confused. He said, I don't even know where he is. So let's look at this scripture here in Matthew it's there in your notes, Matthew chapter 2, verses 1 through 12, the Christmas story. Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea during the reign of King Herod. About the time some wise men from the eastern lands arrived in Jerusalem asking, where is the newborn king of the Jews? 
We saw a star as it rose, and we've come to worship him. King Herod was deeply disturbed when he heard this, and so was everyone in Jerusalem. He called a meeting of the leading priests and teachers of religious law and asked, Where is the Messiah supposed to be born? In Bethlehem, in Judea, they said, for this was what the prophet wrote. And you, O Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are not least among the ruling cities of Judah, for a ruler will come from you who will be a shepherd for my people Israel. Then Herod called for a private meeting with the wise men, and he learned from them the time when the star first appeared. Then he told them, go to Bethlehem, search carefully for the child, and when you find him, come back and tell me so that I can go worship him too. After this interview, the wise men went their way, and the star that they had seen in the east, that now it returns, and it guided them to Bethlehem. It went ahead of them and stopped over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they were filled with joy. Filled with joy when they saw the star. They entered the house and saw the child with his mother Mary, and they bowed down and worshipped him. He would no longer be in the stable. This is 18 to 24 months after his birth. So now they would be in a home. He's something between 18 and 24 months old. So they opened their treasure chest, gave him gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And when it was time to leave, they returned to their own country by another route, for God had warned them in a dream not to return to Herod. It's interesting when I look at this that they just started out their journey when they saw a light. When they saw a light, something turned on and it began directing. It didn't direct them all the way there. It just started their journey. So confused, yep, but they began a journey just like some of us tonight. Maybe we not, we're on the verge of 2020 and we don't know what all is going to happen, but this is what I know. He is the light that directs us and guides us. So now I want to look at this story and I want to see what did they do? And if I understand what they did, then I can apply that to my life. So I've invited my grandson Shade to come and join me at the stage. Would you give him a welcome right now as he comes? Hey, thank you so much for having me here. All right, so I have a lot to say, so I'm just going to jump right into it. All right, so how to overcome the Grinch of confusion. So point number one, be a seeker. All right, say it with me, be a seeker. All right, so what does a seeker do? A seeker chooses to follow God, chooses to follow God's light one step at a time. So be a seeker, follow God's light one step at a time. The wise men, as we saw, they were seekers. They went after it. As soon as they saw the light, the light they went after it. Um, right here. We saw his star in the east, and we have followed it here, seeking to find and worship him. Seeking to find and worship him. Um, they say, we've come from the east, and we're seeking God. I loved that it gives us the direction they came from, a little bit of geography. So they're coming from the east and going west to find Jesus. While they're doing this, the earth, like the planet, on its axis is rotating the opposite direction. So the earth is rotating west to east. They're going from east to west. And so that's pretty cool because in their pursuit and their seeking of Jesus, they have to go against the world. And for us as believers today, we oftentimes have to go against the grain, against the social norm, against the cultural norm in order to seek Jesus. I go to the University of Central Florida. Go Knights. I love it. I love the school, but UCF does not encourage me to seek Jesus. Uh, my high school didn't. My job doesn't encourage me to seek Jesus. You have to go against the grain. And so some of you are seekers tonight as well. Some of you might not have stepped across and invited Jesus to be your Savior or not, but you're thinking about it. You're teetering on the line. And as you are seeking him, I want you to know he is seeking you just as much. As you are seeking him, he's seeking you and wants to call you daughter, wants to call you son, wants to tell you you have purpose, wants to tell you you belong, and there's so much more to you. Francis Thompson was an, I'm sorry I'm going so fast, there's just a lot I have to get and I have seven minutes left. So, <laughs> Francis Thompson was an English poet. He wrote this beautiful poem, it's 147 stanzas, so it's super long, but it describes his journey um, being sought after by Jesus. So he was a drug addict, and he would he lived in London, 
says he would, in the poem, he talks about how he would go on trains just to, just to escape this, like, knocking on his spirit. He felt something calling him. And I'm going to open this. Could you hold this real quick? <laughs> Amen. Thank you. All right. So um, he's on the trains. He's on the trains trying to escape the knocking on his spirit. And he titles the poem, The Hound of Heaven. And goes on to reveal that Jesus is this hound of heaven that's pursuing him. And it's not the pursuit or the chase of a disappointed father or someone who's coming to collect something or some, someone that you owe something. But it's the pursuit of a God who loves you unconditionally and loves you no matter what. He loves you. He is chasing you with a love that is untainted by your mistakes. Yeah. All right. So the wise men, they had to head out in faith. They just saw this light. It was the general direction when they were going there because they go to Herod and ask, like, where is he? So it's just the general direction. It's not like God took out his iPhone and dropped a pen and was like, it's a three-hour drive, four and a half if you avoid tolls. It's, it wasn't like that. So they had to go out in faith. They didn't understand all the details. They just started the journey. And if that's you tonight teetering on the line, don't, I guess you can say, Spend so much time thinking about the details. Just start your journey. Don't read, like, books and books in theology before you've even taken time to actually talk to God. So make sure to just go ahead and start it. Um, start with the light you have been given. We all have a light we've been given in our life. Um, parents, it might be one of your kids have gotten saved in youth ministry. Um, so the, your kids could be a light in your life. Kids, it could be the opposite. Your parents, it could be coworkers. It could be someone inviting you to the service tonight. That was the light that is guiding you ultimately to him. The trip was not a day trip that the wise men took. They had a caravan. Um, and it cost them so much time, money, and energy. They invested so, so much just to go see Jesus and worship him. They invested an incredible amount. So they were willing to invest whatever it costs to reach Jesus. So tonight, I'm going to ask you, what are you willing to invest in order to have a relationship with him? And as you're thinking about that, I want to remind you what he invested to have you. And what he invested was the cross, and he paid for it with his own blood. So just remember how much more his investment, how much more his commitment is to you. He wants you. He wants to seek you. He loves you. Yeah. So the wise men did not give up their search until they found Jesus. Yeah, and I hope you don't either. Some of you have been raised going to church, like you were raised going to church as a kid, but you just kind of dropped off. You can name a few Bible verses, you know the books of the Bible, you can like navigate the Bible, you know the stories, but you don't really know Jesus. You know a lot about Jesus, but you don't really know Jesus. And there's a big difference between knowing of and then knowing him. There's a big difference there. Take that idea and go with me to Matthew 6. So Matthew 6, Jesus is talking. He's like, yo, what up, Jesus? I'm talking. And um, he's telling everybody, don't worry, basically. Don't worry about your future. If I can take care of the animals, of you know, nature, I can take care of you, someone that I have paid for, someone that I, you are a bearer of my image. I'm going to take care of you. So Matthew 6, 33, here we go. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added to you. So I think it's interesting how it is the kingdom of God and then his righteousness. So you have the kingdom, broad statement, his righteousness, specific statement. And I think that's juxtaposed in order to reveal that is his righteousness, which covers the entire kingdom. All healing. And the kingdom comes from just one man's healing. All restoration in the kingdom comes from one man's power. All forgiveness in the kingdom came from one man who forgave and paid the price. And that's Jesus. That just shows the importance of how you need to know Jesus, not just know of. Because only by his righteousness and you having a relationship with that and experiencing his mercy and experiencing his grace can you become a part of that kingdom. Yeah. But still, we especially myself, have a problem doing this and just following that guiding light. Uh, we want a map. Everybody wants a map of their life. You want to know, this is where I'm born. I'm going to go to school here. It's probably going to be UCF, that school. And then, um, <laughs> yeah, 
Um, they're not national champs. I just want to say that. Don't judge me. I don't think UCF are national champs. They didn't win it. All right. But they are good. So we want a map of uh, who we're going to marry, where we're going to work, how much money we're going to make, etc. But the wise men didn't have a map, and they did great. <laughs> like, they just followed this one little light. They just followed the one little light. They didn't have the map. And if God's giving you a light and you have a good God, you want to be where a good God wants you to be because it's a way better place than you could ever place yourself in. Yeah. So back to the map. All right. Reason number one, you don't want the map. It would scare you to death if you knew everything that was going to happen to you. It would be terrifying. I'm sorry it's another UCF reference, but if I knew in advance that on September 21st, 2019, UCF would get beat and their two-year win streak would end, I don't know how I would have gone on with life, <laughs> you know? But even in not knowing what happens tomorrow, we can still find confidence and courage in that because we might not know what tomorrow holds, but we know who holds tomorrow. And it's the God that loves you yesterday, today, tomorrow, the exact same. The same grace, the same mercy. There's enough grace for today. There's enough grace for tomorrow. Second reason you don't want a map is because then you wouldn't have to trust him. The relationship would be gone. It'd be broken down. Um, you'd say, you know, I know everything that's going to happen. I'm a God of my own life. I can figure these things out. Maybe I can make UCF win. Um, yeah. But... Even though we don't have that map and we don't know all the plans for our life, this is really awesome thought. God's a God who does not waste resources. So even if you don't know why you're here, like why you're here today, God does, and God doesn't waste resources. So he still has, if you're still breathing, he still has a plan and a purpose for you. And if you're here tonight, he knew you were going to be here tonight, and he wanted you here tonight, and he has a plan and a purpose for you. God doesn't give us a map, but he gives us a compass, and he gives us a guiding light. The compass is the word, scripture. Um, the more you read that, the more direction you will have in your life. The guiding light is the Holy Spirit. Two extremely powerful tools that are way more useful than the map. Um, I'll end my little talk with a poem. It's titled, God Knows. Do we have it on the screen? I have it right here, but here we go. And I said to the man who stood at the gate of the year, give me a light that I may tread safely into the unknown. And he replied, go out into the darkness and put your hand into the hand of God. That shall be better to you than a light and safer than a known way. Thank you so much. Great job, Shade, just like I told you. <laughs> I'm proud of my uh, grandkids, Shade and Zion are here tonight, and I think Raylan is watching. She's all the way in Toowoomba, Australia. Uh, and <laughs> so she's, <laughs> excuse me. Wait a minute. And we sent you a Christmas present on the 11th, and they've lost it. So, anyway. So, let's second fill in. Shade said, first of all, be a seeker. Second of all, be a worshiper. Look at Matthew 2 and 11. And they entered the house, saw the child in the arms of Mary, his mother. Overcome, they kneeled and worshiped him. And they opened their luggage, and they presented gold, frankincense, and myrrh. One little Sunday school kid said they brought to him uh, gold, Frankenstein, and myrtle. <laughs> All three of those gifts are significant of who he is. You give gold to a king. Frankincense, a high priest uses. Myrrh is an embalming spice from the very beginning of his life. The reason that he came, that he left heaven to come here, is to die for your sins and my sins. 
and they finally met Jesus. My question to you tonight is, have you met him? I mean, have you really, really, really met him? When they, when they met him, they became so overcome. It said they, they were overcome and they kneeled down, these wise men, and, and they kneeled down at this little 18-month-old or 24-month-old child because they recognized that probably they were from Persia. And if you go back and you remember who was in Persia in exile, Daniel, and Daniel taught about the Messiah coming. So that's one of the reasons they had been looking for the Messiah for all these years. And they heard about the star. They began to search. And they didn't give up their search until they met him. How sad it would be that you would come tonight, enjoy all of this, and you would leave and you've never really met him. I'll tell you, when you meet him, you're going to be overwhelmed. There'll be times in your life where you'll feel like just falling down at his knees and worshiping him for what he's done in your life. I believe, personally, if you've never had a feeling that you'd just like to kneel down and you'd just like to say, I worship you, Lord, I thank you for what you've done for me, then I'm wondering if you've ever really had an encounter with Jesus. I wonder if you just know religion. You just know going to church. Shade said it. There's a difference in knowing and knowing about. The devil is not an atheist. The scripture says that even Satan and the demons believe. But it doesn't mean that they know him. I, uh, I know Donnie Wahlberg. I do. I do. I mean, I was working out the gym uh, years ago when my girls were younger. And uh, uh, working out, and somebody said, do you know who that is? said, no, I have no idea. That's Donnie Wahlberg from New Kids on the Block. They got a concert tonight. I said, oh, that's cool. My, my, my girls, they, they really like his music. They like him. So uh, we're, I took some time, and I meandered over to him and said, hey, I introduced myself. I said, my girls are going to flip out to know that I worked out with you in the gym today. He said, oh, yeah. He said, are they home? I said, yeah. He said, let's call them. <laughs> that was before cell phones. We had a pay phone in the locker room. So we went and made the locker room, and, and, I, said, and I said, hey, uh, uh, girls, uh, Donnie Wahlberg is here, and you could hear them screaming, and he said, uh, uh, come to the concert tonight, I have some tickets for you at the window, and you can get in. I know Donnie Wahlberg. <laughs> no, I know about him. I don't know him. I don't know what his favorite foods are. I don't know what he really enjoys. I know about him but I don't know him. You see, you can come to church and you can know about Jesus, but when you really meet him, when you really know him, and you surrender your life to him, it makes all the world of difference. You see, uh, he came to this earth and he died for your sins and my sin. He even said that. He even said that. Listen to what he says. Uh, to, uh, he says, the son of man must suffer many things and be killed and be raised on the third day. Then he said to them, if anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. He said, do you want to be my disciple? It's more than just praying a little prayer of salvation and then doing whatever you want to do. It's more than that. It's more than just saying, oh, I want you to set me free and get rid of this guilt. He's not a jacuzzi Jesus that just warm, fuzzily meets everything in our life. He says, look, if you want to come after me, you are to deny yourself. You know what that means? It's not about me. It's not about me. And he said, then take up your cross and follow me. That's self-denial, and that's saying I'm willing to deny myself whatever I need because I, more than anything else, I want to know him. Maybe somebody here tonight, for the very first time in your life, you're ready to say, you know what? I need his grace. I need his forgiveness in my life. Maybe you've never experienced that. And I dare say there's somebody here tonight, maybe even watching online, that you've gone to church before, but you've never really met Jesus. You know about him. You've heard the Bible stories. You've read those. But you've never invited him into your heart and into your life. Could I encourage you tonight to let this be the night that you do that? In a moment, I'm going to ask those of you who would say, you know what? I need his forgiveness. I need his grace. I'm going to ask you to express that in just a minute by raising your hand. And you know, even when I said that, you know who you are. 
You know who you are. I don't have to point. The Holy Spirit's been drawing you like a magnet. And some of you, it's, it's all new. And you say, I, I, just, I just feel like I'm being drawn to the Lord. And, and I know some of you tonight are feeling the, the weight of your sin. You're feeling the shame of your sin. You're feeling the guilt of your sin that you're here tonight. But I've got good news for you. The best news I could offer is called the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes on him, that we believe on him, that we don't die, and that's the end of it, but he comes into our life, he forgives us of the past sins, he gives us a purpose for life, and he gives us the hope of spending an eternity with him. Would you bow your heads with me? Tonight, maybe you say, you know what? I need his forgiveness. I feel the weight of my sin, the shame of my sin, and I need him tonight in my life more than anything else. God loves you so very, very much tonight. And he wants you to be his child. If that's you tonight and you say, you know what, Terry? I've been trying to do it on my own, but I can't do it on my own. I need some help. What you really need is a Savior, a Savior who wants to forgive you of your sins and come into your life. Maybe years ago, as Shade said, you used to walk with the Lord, but somehow you've got sidetracked, somehow you've got confused by the world. But tonight, you'd say, you know what? Beginning this new year, beginning tonight, getting myself settled for a new year, I want to invite Christ back into my life. I want to follow him. If that's you, would you make, raise your hand and make eye contact with me and say, that's me. Thank you. Thank you this morning. Thank you tonight. Others back here. Thank you. Others. Thank you. Thank you. Others. Just raise your hand. Thank you. Thank you. Others tonight say, that's me. Maybe somebody watching online. So that's, that's me. That's me. Would you do this? Would you stand? Everybody stand with me. Nobody should have to pray this prayer alone. Nobody should have to stand uh, uh, alone. And that's what Christmas is all about. Jesus came that we wouldn't have to do that. Would you pray this prayer with me? We've all prayed a prayer like this at some time or another. I can give you the words, but you have to surrender the heart. Surrender the heart to really get to know Jesus. And if you'll do that, let me tell you what will happen. He will forgive you of your sins. He will give you a purpose for living now. And he will give you the hope if Tim's, if Tim's mom is in heaven right now <laughs> rejoicing. And I'm going to tell you, it's worth it all. Pray this prayer with me. Father God, thank you for loving me. Thank you for caring, me, for caring for me. Thank you for sending your son Jesus to die for my sins. I ask you to forgive me of my sins, to come into my life, and to be my Savior. I need a Savior. As best as I know how, I'm going to serve you all the days of my life. Fill me with your spirit. In your name, Jesus, I pray. Thank you for watching today. It really means a lot that you'd take time out of your busy schedule and join us. And I hope that teaching today was meaningful to your life because our prayer here at the Father's house, we've been praying all week long that whatever that the Lord gives us on Sundays would impact your life. And it means so much that you're watching today. And maybe you want to partner with us and support this ministry. You can do that in several ways. You can do it by prayer. That's one of the biggest needs. But also, if you'd like to support and become a, a team member with us here at the Father's House by your financial contribution, that helps us to continue to do what we're doing. That helps us to continue with our missionaries in Africa, South America, around the world, and our community projects of how that we're adopting how that we're working in the high school to uh, provide the needs for young people. So I really encourage you to support this, not just, not just to receive from this ministry, but also support. And uh, I just, again, want to say how much I appreciate you watching, and I invite you to watch again next week at this same time. So be blessed. We'll be praying for you.